It was the summer of 1977, hazy, hot, and humid, the way they always were in New Jersey. I was 13, had just graded, graduated from the eighth grade, and was now on the threshold of high school. That year, I'd finished a successful stint as editor of my middle school's newspaper, The Eagle. My grades were rock solid, and I was hoping my braces would be coming off the following spring. They would not be coming off. <laughs> My older sister, Judy, was 15, and she and I were best friends. Sure, we had other friends in our respective grades and schools, but at home, we were inseparable. As soon as summer vacation began, we'd spend long days hanging out on the brown and gold shag carpeting in Judy's bedroom, listening to one album after another on her stereo, the only turntable in the house, turned up loud so we could hear it over the window air conditioner. <clears throat> We lived in the suburbs of Manhattan, a town divided into white families with money and everyone else. My family fell into the latter category. So as school was letting out and my peers were discussing their summer plans, it was clear a great many of them would be hanging out at the swim club, a kind of bare bones country club with an Olympic sized swimming pool, restaurant, attractive lifeguards, and a bar for the moms, of course. <laughs> My family, however, could not afford the swim club, so we did our swimming at Pine Lake instead, which most of the kids at school called the mud hole. They laughed when they said it, incredulous that anyone would want to swim in that brownish green water. To be fair, Pine Lake was kind of a mud hole. It was man-made and small, but my sister and I loved it. <clears throat> there was a wooden raft in the center of the lake where older kids would hang out, a snack bar where we were allowed to eat hot dogs and shoestring fries, and a jukebox, which that summer played Carole King and Jackson Brown and the Eagles and Rush all day long. It was heaven in so many ways. My mom, happily on the sand reading People magazine, the coconut smell of copper tone suntan lotion in the air, and my sister and I set free. Although I was technically a teenager, I was very small. I mean, really small. I was eons away from puberty, shorter than most of the other girls, and underweight. I left middle school a whopping 57 pounds. I know. And I wasn't particularly athletic either. In gym class, when we would divide into teams for softball, I was always one of the last two kids left at the end of the selection process when the team captains would shoot it out to decide who got me. It won't come as a shock to learn that I was not a strong swimmer. Three years of summer lessons had left me with an ability to doggy paddle and a great fear of being in water that was over my head. The previous summer, I had learned to back float. And while floating and feeling miraculously light and buoyant, I turned my head to make sure the teacher was still beside me, her hand beneath my upper back. When I saw she wasn't there, and that I was floating on water without assistance, I panicked, falling back into the brown-green water, which filled my mouth, nose, and eyes. Any faith I had in my ability to stay afloat evaporated after that, and I rarely let myself go out in the lake past the point where I could stand. My sister Judy, however, was the opposite of me. At 15, puberty was a distant memory. She was eight or nine inches taller than I was, about 50 pounds heavier, and much stronger. Judy could swim well, but stayed in the shallows to hang out with me. That summer, she wore a pretty blue one-piece bathing suit, and she looked good, although I don't think she knew it. The only thing she knew was that the lifeguard watching over us was Steve Vasanska, who would be a senior that fall. Uh -huh. A year ahead of her. He was cute and popular with his biceps and red hair. When we first got to Pine Lake that summer and saw Steve up on the chair, Judy had initially been mortified. What was Steve Vasanska doing lifeguarding at Pine Lake? He should be at the swim club with all the other good-looking high school student lifeguards. Pine Lake lifeguards were notorious for their lack of cuteness. They were either retirement-aged men looking for some extra cash or the least attractive boys at area high schools, the ones that didn't get jobs at the swim club. Yet here Steve was, up on the tall white chair, protecting us. 
One day, late in August, when the light was weakening and shadows lengthening, my sister suggested we try to swim out to the raft in the center of the lake. She had done it many times, and it wasn't that hard. Wouldn't it be good for me to try, at least once, before Pine Lake closed for the summer? And for some reason, the teenagers that usually isolated themselves from the rest of us, sunbathing all day on the raft, weren't there. Likely some had already left for college. I looked at Judy, considering the proposition, and quietly surveyed the situation. My mom had run to the supermarket down the street and told us she'd be back in a couple of hours. The coast, as they say, was clear. Steve, the lifeguard, was reading a paperback, looking up now and then to make sure no one was drowning. It felt like an opening, an opportunity, and I wanted to feel grown up like my sister, wanted to do something big that summer, something that made me feel ready for high school and all that was to come. Swimming, or at least doggy paddling, to the raft with Judy by my side seemed exciting. Okay, I said, but what if I get tired and can't make it? Judy thought for a moment. I'll tell you what we'll do, she said. You hold on to me with one hand and doggy paddle with your feet in the other hand. So I'll help you along to the raft and you won't get tired. This sounded like a good plan to me, one that assured my survival. We waded into the cool, mucky water. Judy began to paddle a little and I walked until I was on my tiptoes. Okay, I said, it's almost over my head. Here, Judy said, pointing to her hip. Just hold on here. I grabbed as well as I could, eventually just holding on to the fabric of her swimsuit. We started moving toward the raft, me doing some kind of hybrid between a side wiggle and a doggy paddle, and Judy swimming like a normal person with a freestyle stroke. With my left hand attached to my sister's body, or at least her swimsuit, I felt like nothing bad could happen to me. Judy, I knew, would not let me drown. She swam easily and strongly, navigating the way. I was barely a drag on her, and her strength bolstered me. Soon, much sooner than I anticipated, Judy said, it's right there. I'm going to grab it, and then you let go of me and hold on to the raft, too. I did just as I was told, waiting until my sister's arms were securely on top of the raft's surface, and then I grabbed a hold, too. She pulled herself up onto the wooden platform, and I followed, though far less gracefully, scrambling up there like a crab. We both sat, looking out across the expanse of the lake. I felt, for the first time, like a real teenager. Judy had seen the world before from this coveted vantage point, this place where all the older kids, high on weed they'd smoked behind the snack bar, sunned themselves and flirted with one another. I'd always watched from the sidelines, imagining what it must feel like. And now here I was. I was on the raft. <laughs> the sun-baked wood felt warm on our wet bottoms, and Judy and I sat chatting about how easy it had been to do this and how fun it was to be here together. We scanned the sand for our mother, but she wasn't back yet. We'd been sitting like that for about 10 minutes when we heard the sound of arms rhythmically slicing into water and saw a body gliding toward us. We both stared as if watching a shark approach. Then we saw the red curls, the muscled arms and torso of Steve Vysanska, and we both knew he wasn't coming to flirt. We looked at each other. Judy mouthed the words, uh-oh, and we sat waiting. Suddenly, there was Steve's face erupting from the lake. He shook his head back and forth once, clearing the water out of his eyes. Hey, he said, sounding almost apologetic. He was talking to Judy. It looked like you were carrying on her on your arm out here. Judy didn't answer. He looked at me. Can you swim? I felt my face burning up with embarrassment, not just because we'd been caught breaking the raft rules, but because we'd been caught by Steve Vysanska. He floated there in all his on-the-cusp-of-manhood handsomeness. <laughs> this boy, who was also now a senior, in the high school where I would be a freshman in two weeks. I couldn't meet his eye. Judy looked at me and I saw her cheeks were flushed too. She can swim, she's had lessons. She was just scared, Judy said. I didn't carry her, she just held on to me, but she was swimming. Okay, Steve said, because you can't come out to the raft if you can't swim by yourself. Now he was looking at me. So you have to leave now and you have to swim back to the beach by yourself. 
You can't hang on to your sister. I'll be behind you, just to make sure. My heart immediately began racing, and then it felt as if it had dropped like a heavy stone into my stomach. I think Judy was worried I'd start crying. You can do it, she said. I'll swim next to you. I looked from her face to the lake to Steve and then back to the lake. Judy repeated, you can do it. You were barely holding on to me. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I was so desperate to find a way out. You would have thought I'd just been informed I had to walk the plank and jump to my death. <laughs> Rather than having been told I'd have to sw swim half the width of a small man-made lake with my sister beside me and a lifeguard behind me. <laughs> I rose slowly to my feet. The whole situation felt surreal. Was I really going to swim by myself across this lake to the shore? Because I can't swim, I thought. Not like Steve and Judy. Yet there I was, getting ready to jump into the water. I pulled my swimsuit a little more snugly down around my thighs and said, OK. Judy slipped into the water, and Steve paddled in place, waiting for us to start. I was amazed at how he had been floating there the entire time we were talking, as if it were no big deal, even though I knew the bottom of the lake was nowhere near his feet. I took a deep breath and threw myself off the raft and into the water. With my eyes tightly shut against what I assumed would either be my death or massive humiliation, and at that point I wasn't sure which would be worse, I went under, taking in a sickening gulp of water and spinning out as much as I could when I surfaced. My heart was pounding, and for a moment I thought, this is it. I'm going to drown in Pine Lake, which isn't even a real lake. But then I gathered all my strength and pushed my neck up and body sideways. I shot a glance at Judy, who was watching me, swimming sl slow and strong beside me, and started doing my frenetic half-doggy paddle, half-wiggle. And it worked. After a couple of minutes of adrenaline-fueled movement, I realized I was swimming, sort of. I wasn't holding on to my sister. I was on top of the water, moving through it, Moving forward, I opened my eyes. I could see the sand, and I knew I'd make it. I could feel my own power, that I was capable of muscling through something that had felt really hard, that had felt impossible, in fact. When we got to the sand, Judy grabbed me and said, you did it, I knew you could do it. She turned to Steve, smiling. See, she said, she can swim by herself. Yeah, OK, he said, and shrugged before walking back to his chair. I sat down on the sand to catch my breath. My whole body was shaking from effort and fear and something new, euphoria. My shame had been papered over with pride. It was the most confident and proud of myself I would feel for a long, long time. And I knew it was mostly because of my sister. Because even though I wasn't yet capable of believing in me, she was. Thank you. Eileen Zimmerman.